I guess the title of this is uh, Stories About Subjects, Objects, and Tools, and it is kind of about subjectivity. And uh, if you want to see a totally different view of what subjectivity is all about, I commend to you Roberto and Marek's uh, first chapter in the book, Coriomata. And I think I'm taking a totally different approach than you guys. But anyway, that's okay. Um, that's, you know, we need diversity in this world. So, uh, but uh, this is uh, my uh, monodrama from uh, last year, which is about, uh, it's called, the, Re it's called uh, the Song of the Shank, which is about the uh, blind Tom. And this is the coming uh, to life of blind Tom after being dead for a number of years. I think it's going to work. Is it, are we hearing anything? We're not hearing anything. Why are we not hearing anything? Let's try it. Let's see if we can hear something. I'm going I'm to make a test. Let's try this. See if we hear anything that way. Oh, I might have turned. Did I turn it? Did I turn it off? Did I turn off the hearing thing? Uh, so far, we're playing sound, but we're not hearing any sound. Ah, good. Okay. Can we that? Great. Just try. Let's do a little sound check. Oh, that's pretty bad. I, I, mine is up as high as it can go. Okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> here we go. Uh, let's try it again. So here we are, uh, starting over. The next uh, sound clip I play plays a little better than that one. But in any event, um, this is a... Uh... Oh, wow. It's... Now it's really weird. I'm not playing anything right now. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is one of the first... This is the first chapter. It's called Resistant Objects or The Commodity Who Spoke. Uh, this is uh, Blind Tom or Thomas Wiggins. Uh, he was born in 1849, uh, born a slave in the uh, southern United States, in Georgia, and uh, became a virtuoso pianist. That was some of, that's some of the music he played. He composed, he played over 5,000 pieces, all of which were memorized because he was blind. And uh, he wrote uh, several hundred pieces as well. And we'll be hearing one of those. But in terms of uh, the American uh, chattel slavery regime, Blind Tom was just an object. You know, he wasn't, didn't have any subjectivity, no sense of interiority. But somehow, the paradox was, that he, despite being black, blind, and enslaved, and making some of the same moves as, let's say, Mozart, but uh, being able to memorize things and hearing uh, ones hearing them and things like that, and being a composer and having these incredible range of pieces and glad fast repertoire of things. Despite all that, the paradox in the American slavery system, which is still a paradox today in terms of race. Uh, in many in many cases, including including right here, um, is that um, he would be considered an object. But the, and so here's a little bit of Blind Tom's final piece. You can see here, and there's another interesting thing about Blind Tom. If you notice these little doodads there, though that's notation for tone clusters. Now this is 1863, well before Henry Cowell. <laughs> So, 1863, there you go. And, um, but uh, Fred Moten uh, has a very, made a very interesting comment about this that I think relates to Blind Tom. The truth about the value of this, he was just a commodity, right? People were sold, their families were sold. I mean, my family, I'm certain, is a product of all that. My whole being is a, is a product of that system in which uh, it could be easily sold to your, your mother or your father. It could be sold and sent off somewhere. And in fact, uh, many slave plantations were engaged in uh, breeding as, of slaves as a business. 
So in any event, but that's all commodification. But as Fred says, the truth about the value of the commodity is tied precisely to the impossibility of it speaking. For if the commodity could speak, it would have intrinsic value. It would be infused with a certain spirit, a certain value not given from the outside. So Blind Tom's sounding uh, paradoxically transcended his objectification and confounded the uh, racial order. So, um, so now, he, he, this is the second part. It's called new subjects. Um, so we talked about objects for a minute, or resistant objects. So now we're going to talk about subjects. And the first subject we're going to talk about is the uh, RUR. This is Carl Chopek's play from the 1920s. RUR, Rossum's Universal Robots. And of course, this is where the term robot comes from, from the Robota system, which is the system of a Czech uh, feudal serfdom, sort of like the American sharecropping. Helena jumping up. Oh, that's absurd. Sala isn't a robot. Sala is a girl like me. Sala, this is outrageous. Why do you take part in such a hoax? I am a robot. No, no, you are not telling the truth. I know they forced you to do it for an advertisement. Sala, you're a girl like me, aren't you? I'm sorry, Miss Glory. Sula is a robot. It's a lie. Excuse me, Miss Glory. Then I must convince you. Enter Marius. Marius? Take Sula into the dissecting room and tell them to open her up at once. When they've cut her open, you can go and have a look. No, no. You wouldn't have her killed. You can't kill machines. So um, here's another uh, one of those new subjects. This is going outside of music for a little bit, but I hope you don't mind. I write programs. Programs make drawings. Drawings are made completely by the computer. This isn't the case of computer-aided art making. Harold Cohen has been an artist and computer scientist for over 20 years. I talked with him in his studio in San Diego on the University of California campus, where he has developed his own expert system to create original art. computer being creative? Cre I think creativity is a relative term. It, it, clearly the machine is being creative. The program is being creative to the degree that every time it does a drawing, it does a drawing that nobody's ever seen before, right. including me. And that's a very interesting thing about that. It does a drawing that's never been seen before. And, uh, but, you know, this is 19, he started making his first ones, I think, 1972. Uh, you couldn't scour the internet. In fact, the internet wasn't really operative for most people. And uh, you had to sort of build a system that would create what you wanted to create. And if you built it in a rich enough fashion, you didn't really know what it was going to do. So that reminded me of that discussion this earlier today about the difference between closed and open systems. And that's one of those things where we assume that we're the open system and that the computers are the closed systems. But in fact, we don't really know because the only way you really know how these things work is to interact with them. You know, it's not phenotype. It's, it's not genotype, it's phenotype. So you have to be able to go in there and interact. And when that's, then that's when you find out how closed or open something is. And there'll always be something that maybe you didn't find out about. So the closed and open system thing, thing to me seemed to replicate a discourse of objects and subjects. Um, so, but this is a form of generative AI. And so is this. And uh, this is something I've been doing for a while myself. I started in 79, Harold started around 72. But a lot of it was the same ideas with one big exception. Um, the, the, uh, I, without reading all that junk, I'm just going to say that the, 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 uh, the most important part is the, the last paragraph is the system operates like Harold's system did. Uh, it doesn't need you to make music. You don't have to play anything. There are no prompts. You just, play, you just push the button and it starts playing. Uh, so that basically it makes things up from what it does. And whether it's improvising or composing, that's more of a political decision, an ideological decision than anything else. It doesn't know and really don't either. And so the whole question of whether the difference between improvisation and composition uh, becomes uh, basically made moot uh, by systems of this kind. And the other thing that this thing does that the, <clears throat> that the other systems didn't do was it had to listen. <coughs> so... Basically, it plays differently with different people, and so the program generates its complex responses. <coughs> Maybe I'll get my water. But it, also, thank you. But it, 
but it also uh, creates its own uh, independent um, uh, music making. So they come together. So in, a, in that sense, there's a construction of a commodity who spoke a subject, more or less, in that sense. It's one mode of subjectivity. Here's an earlier mode of subjectivity. Um, Letitia Tsunami talked earlier about the League of Automatic Music Composers. Well, one guy from that league, Rich Gold, kind of joined the corporate world, and he created this uh, AI game, as he called it, called Little Computer People. The thing about Little Computer People was, I remember running into Rich. I don't know, I was, I was in San Francisco. I ran into him on the street. And he said, I said, well, look, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm building this, I'm building this thing that's going to be a little person that lives on your hard drive. I said, what's it going to do? He said, well, whatever it wants. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, that's what it did. And so it didn't give a shit what you thought. It just did whatever it wanted to do. But the little computer person wasn't entirely non-interactive. You could bring it things if you if you brought it a record album and it was very happy and it did things. But if you if if you ignored it or if you didn't give it enough food, after all, it would look very sort of sad, sort of like Tamagotchis, uh, but much earlier. Um, so here's another early uh, AI generative uh, thing, mine from about '79. <laughs> That sort of worked like um, like some of those some some of those medieval things we heard about in the first uh, episode without going into it, and that's basically how it was made, very homemade and so on. Um, but in any event, uh, the expression of that kind of subjectivity is very uh, succinctly put by Douglas R. Ewart in our 1984 uh, uh, that uh, 1984 rehearsals and performance. The machine is an improviser mm -hmm. who might not have the same seasoning that we do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but he's improvising anyway. Mm -hmm. So I deal with that. Yeah. Yeah, so subjectivity as it presents to you rather is, is what you go on rather than an a priori attribution. In other words, in some sense, uh, if the system presents itself to you as something that can dialogue with you, then you have to accept its subjectivity rather than assuming that it's an object that you can control or something that you can instrumentalize like a tool. So that's one thing that happens. Those, those, those uh, issues are confronted quite early on. I could present that as being kind of a so-called Turing test, but that's not what I'm here to do. I actually want to talk about the aspect of what happens when two subjects exchange narratives. Well, we don't know who these people are. I mean, there could be both people, they could be both computers, they could be both recordings, or they could be whatever they are. And, but I'm using this example to talk more about and this, you know, the blindfold test, you guys who know about jazz, you know, they have the blindfold test and all that. Anyway, so who was playing? That's who was playing.
So, Jerry, we did, uh, we did Q&A after these concerts. We would go, and, we, and with the philosopher Arnold I. Davidson, we would address the, we'd have a panel discussion, and we'd uh, take audience uh, questions. I found the same types of challenges um, <clears throat> that I found playing in other duo piano settings. Um, you know, I, have, I had to listen. And I had to respond. I felt vulnerable in in the moment, you know, from from idea to idea. And I was really paying attention because I felt vulnerable. Is that to say is that to say that you didn't feel like the the um, machine was going to step in and hold you up if the per, if, you know if you were coming to a a low point on your side? Well, I, I, I just think it, um, you know, I did feel that it was responding, and I couldn't, I, I didn't know how it was going to respond, but I knew it was going to. So it was, it was harder to predict than with a, a human associate, of course. I, I don't know if I would say that. So the odd thing about that was the, the assumption on the, on the questioner's end was that we knew that this was a closed system and we knew that it was sort of random and so it would be very difficult to dialogue with. And Jerry Allen, I mean, she played with Ornette Coleman and Wayne Shorter, so she knew what it was like to play with people. And she knew what it was like to play with people at a very high level who, with whom you could exchange sonic narratives. And the fact that she felt she could do that with this other pianist that was not a computer, that was not a human being, was very interesting for me and for her, and it was, it was a, sort of an endorsement of a certain point of view about subjectivity and where it comes from, and sort of a different, a sort of something that where we have to think about the computer in this sense, this kind of, as not, not just generative, but, but exchangist AI, or some sort of other mode of thinking about it, interactive, you know? Um, so that basically, um, a performance of Voyager, I wrote this in 2000, 24 years ago, uh, is conceptualized, interacts as parallel streams of music generation with computers and the humans, basically an improvidative, non-hierarchical, subject-subject model of discourse rather than stimulus response. And then in 2007, we have the anthropologist Lucy Suchman talking about subject-object difference in a very similar way, the ar arising emergently from material, material discursive processes. In other words, being a non-human or doing, or doing human or non-human is a doing or becoming, so that agency becomes a performative achievement rather than something that inheres in subjects or, or, or that sort of thing. So, and um, so of course, Ada Lovelace, so we had to put her in there. So I'm very happy to see her there as well. So, and so the final part of this uh, short meditation, I uh, just asked a couple questions. Now, um, here's something, I, I was at Tanglewood and I came across this thing, which is a very nice thing, and I'm just gonna play it for you. That's it. Yeah, we didn't need to, I didn't need to get, you got the point already. And I guess they did what the people often do now is that they train a, a device on uh, the various symphonies or and, and over Beethoven, and then it can sort of reproduce them, and that's great. Uh, but um, so the question is, we already, since we already had Beethoven, see, from the standpoint of black people, uh, back in the old days, you know, people would say to you, well, you sound like so-and-so, you got to get your own sound. And they'd say, well, yeah, we do that. And, and if they saw you with one of those riff books, say, the Coltrane you know, song book, they'd say, they'd knock it right out of your head. Get that shit out of here. <laughs> you, know? you have to be your own person. So in other words, become a subject, don't be an imitator. So it ends up being something that they would do, and that's the regime I grew up with, with as a player. Now, uh, so did this person, John Coltrane. He also grew up with that. But this is a very different kind of Coltrane. In fact, it's not Coltrane. It's an AI doodad trained to sound like Coltrane. And here it is. Okay, so this is great. But I'm trying to figure out, just thinking for myself, um, We've sort of come a long way in the last 10 minutes from looking at these machines that create on their own and present as subjects, or present as independent uh, creators of things, to things that imitate. 
and that uh, are used as tools to create other kinds of invitations. This is something I'd like to be able to discuss as we get into the Q&A about uh, this business. One of the questions I have is basically, how does this, how does this change the human subject when, uh, when we migrate from uh, uh, exchanges of subjectivity to re-instrumentalizing the computer to become a tool for creating, like the, the what was it? The thing said uh, you can create a sound and you can create a song in ten minutes and then sell it on the internet. And I guess if that's what AI is for, that's great. But um, uh, but the I just remember the people I came up with. Um, they thought that it was about basically using the technology to think more about what it meant to be human. So when people would ask me, they'd say, well, how, why, do you, why do you play with computers and not with people? Was, I play with both, and I think the idea is for me, by developing these devices, I was able to think hard about um, what kinds of things people expected from the musical experience and how they managed to present those and convey those experiences. So that when... So basically, this is a version, as Lester Bowie would say, of artists teaching people how to live. And so in a sense, computers, I developed ideas about, about improvisation through listening to and performing with and, uh, and building these uh, systems. But anyway, but they were never thought of as instruments or tools, and so people would often say, you'd have to tell people, say, well, it's not an instrument. You can't do anything with it. You can't tell it what to do. There's no, put, there's no button you can push to tell it how to react or how to respond. If you wanted to do something, you have to play with it. And maybe it will respond to you and maybe it won't. And it's, it's his choice, just it's your choice to do what you want to do. Uh, so at eventually a certain place, uh, your, your two systems will find commonality. But in, event, in any event, that commonality will be a performative achievement uh, rather than something which we mandate and so there are no guarantees and uh, so i think i'm going to leave it there and instead of having q a let's just have the panel right now we can talk about q a would you mind if there are 